And when we have new teachers, we're just going to have them watch this, and then we can just go straight to the exercises. This is sort of an overview of how we've designed the crypto thread. Uh, and I had this presentation because this is something I presented last year. Um, oh, thread. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> thread. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and um, uh, the idea here, a lot of people got tripped up on the crypto thread that first day. So the idea here is to increase the bandwidth of help on that first day by uh, having you be able to do all of the crypto exercises. Actually, throughout the entire thread, the teachers will be able to understand how to solve every single problem that the students will get, aside from the last urban race thing, because that's where the excitement happens. Uh, and those, like, those get traded at real time break those the day before anyway. So um, so this is the overview, though. So um, I think it really helps to look at the design of this thing before jumping in and doing the puzzles. Uh, so this is what I'll do. I'll talk about uh, this thing. And uh, so start with the motivation. So why did we design this the way we did? Um, so the first uh, overall goal was to expand the security pipeline. So there's a lot of efforts to try and get kids engaged early in security. Uh, and there's been two sorts of sets of approaches. One is to do camps, which is what this is. It's a camp. Um, and so here are some examples of this. Uh, the other thing is uh, that's being done is to create these capture the flag security games that people can play wherever they are. So websites that are devoted to this. Uh, you could create high school clubs of students that are basically solving these things. You know, every you know, after school clubs, that, that's all they do. Um, and so th those are the two modes of engagement, typically. Uh, and so what we're trying to do is we're trying to do both at the same time. We're at a camp, and we're, within the camp, we're going to create this CTF, because the format is really engaging if you ever uh, get involved in this. Um, and so we want to focus on intrinsic motivation. What can motivate kids to put in a lot of work and enjoy it? So it's like, it's like the educational unicorn. <laughs> Can we do both at the same time? And this is our attempt to try and to try and achieve that. Uh, and so what is it? It's a scaffolded CTF game to cultivate confidence and confidence in students. Uh, and this builds to an urban race, uh, which augments the learning with a physical activity. They'll be running all over campus trying to uh, solve these challenges. And then we embed this in a fictional storyline that's very familiar to them. So it's Divergent, uh, the, the book series, if you've, if you've read that. Uh, and this sort of allows them to blend the real and the virtual world, and then get the, to get a little bit of a role play uh, as, as part of this plot. OK, so and the overall goal is to create a positive first experience with computer security, to not have their first uh, experience turn them away. And so uh, that's hopefully what we've done. So I'm going to talk about the curriculum. Uh, the curriculum uh, is basically two things that we're interested in introducing. Uh, the first is uh, data encoding and cryptography. And the second is uh, security concepts and tools uh, that people use uh, in, in real life. Uh, an introduction to both. Uh, the way we structure this thread is five technical modules and a movie, uh, the imitation game, which I think is going to be Tuesday night or something like that. Tuesday. Uh, and then we also assume no prior experience uh, from the students. So we, it's really important. Uh, to us to make sure we get people at the ground level. Uh, and that's that's the design. And it was actually distressing to, to realize people were blocked on the first day. That means we didn't really huh, make the ramp up uh, low enough or easy enough. OK. What are the modules? Uh, the first module is motivation. So we try and motivate students to want to uh, sort of pursue this as being an important thing. They don't want to spend time learning something that they don't feel is useful. So that's the first thing. We talk about the uh, sort of cryptography and security throughout history and how it changes uh, certain critical events, uh, in, for example, World War I, World War II, uh, even in this day and age, the election, uh, perhaps. Uh, these sorts of things are what we try and engage. In fact, I might have to update my talk from at the beginning of the camp to, to be more relevant. But we have all uh, sorts of uh, examples. And then we take them from the ground up. We have to first talk about cryptography in the digital domain, because that's where the where we're, we're now practicing it. So in World War One, we were passing you know, telegrams, or in Greek area, we were doing the Roman the, the Caesar wheels and these sorts of things. But we have to teach them uh, data encoding in the digital domain. 
is a hard bit, uh, but we uh, teach them how computers store information, right? from the binary number system, hexadecimal number system. So we do require a little bit of knowledge of sort of how decimal numbers work, right? powers, exponents, these sorts of things. So we are assuming a little bit uh, there in terms of math skills, but that's, that's, that's where we're starting. And then we're going to talk about, these are numbers on the left, binary and hexadecimal. Well, how do we represent characters? That's what we ask you. Uh, how do we uh, represent binary and uh, binary information in visual uh, encoders like barcodes or QR codes? So we'll talk a, a, a little bit about that just to get them familiar with the fact that information is everywhere and it can be encoded in any number of forms. So that's the module. Uh, and then we go to simple ciphers. So we uh, show them a columnar transposition cipher, a skittly cipher. So these are ciphers that sort of uh, scramble the order of letters. So here is your message. So uh, at the top is your keyword. Uh, and then uh, if you see, this is the plain text. It says, defend the east wall of the castle. And then your cipher would be to scramble the letters alphabetically and then to send that. And then uh, on the other side, the, the receiver would descramble it and then figure out what the message is. So it's a very simple transposition cipher. And it's important to note that these are sort of building blocks for what modern ciphers will do. They'll do transposition, they'll do substitution. Uh, and so this is the very simplest example of a transposition cipher. Uh, there's one, the skittily, where you wrap your message, well, you, you have a, a sheet of paper and you wrap your your message going across the sheet of paper and you wrap it around this rod and then you take a strip of that going around that that sheet and then you'll basically get sort of uh, an nth, every nth letter is encoded uh, sequentially. So the skittily cipher and the columnar transposition ciphers are the two transposition ciphers that we show and then you show people, uh, you show them how it was encoded, how it's decoded, and then they get to practice it using the, um, the challenges that I just out. So we have a, a sheet of 24 challenges. There's some that are columnar transpositions, some of them that are skittily, and they're going to they're going to sit there and decode those uh, uh, for you. Uh, then we go to substitution ciphers. Uh, so monoalphabetic substitution, where you have one translation between one letter to a different letter. And so if you ever played those uh, magic ink ones, the invisible ink ones, where they've got symbols that are associated with each letter. That's a monoalphabetic cipher. And then you go and you map the letters to the symbols and find out what the message is. Uh, so that's what they'll be doing. Uh, the Caesar cipher, which is what that wheel is, it's a cipher where the substitution pattern is based on the rotation of that wheel. And then you translate letters from the inner wheel to the outer uh, and vice versa. So they'll get some of those messages that are a bunch of these random crazy characters zap through that plot. And then they have the wheel. They're like, well, which rotation will give me English text? back out. So that's what they're doing. And there's only 26, because the, you know, there's only 26 ways you can rotate that, it's one of 26. Uh, and then they understand that, yeah, mono, monoalphabetic ciphers, those are sort of easy to break. And then we're like, okay, of course it's easy to break. So then we're going to talk about polyalphabetic substitution. And this is a little bit more difficult, and that's what the Visionaire uh, cipher is. Uh, this is a, actually, I have a blow up of this. I don't, okay. So both the Visionaire and the Enigma are polyalphabetic ciphers, meaning that there are multiple alphabets, and the alphabets change based on the letter being encrypted. And so the Visionaire is, is simple. You have your plain text on the top. You have the Visionaire key, the character of the Visionaire key on the left. And then your ciphertext is a table of them. And so what they'll be doing is they'll be getting a message encrypted with Visionaire, and they'll be like, oh, I know the key is over here on the left, and the key is, is sort of, uh, we'll, we'll go through examples of this, but the key is repeated below your plain text, and then you do a table lookup uh, to, to do this. So they'll be doing the reverse, and that's what we'll be teaching. Uh, and, and I have um, video walkthroughs of all of this, so that uh, before camp, just before camp, you can watch all of them, and then you should be able to just rock and roll on all of these challenges to be able to teach them, or, or guide them, I should say, solving them. We also have the Enigma, and this is where we uh, segue into the movie, because uh, the Enigma is a very sophisticated polyalphabetic uh, cipher, uh, but we'll have them analyze a little bit of how the Enigma worked, and what kind of protection it had, and why it was pretty strong. 
but also how they broke it. And that's where in the movie, the pivotal scene in the movie is at the bar when, uh, I forgot the character's name, but she, uh, she meant, someone mentioned talking to the operator saying, this guy sends the exact same mes message over and over again. It's scrambled, but it's the exact same thing. And that's the thing that broke the enigma. So we want, so the goal is to get enough of the enigma to explain so that they understand exactly that thing in that movie. And that's a hard get, but uh, for some of the, the, the sharper students, hopefully they, they can be like, oh wow, that's pretty cool. Okay, uh, so the Enigma suffered from many things. Uh, one of them was distributing keys. And so uh, we talk about this, how uh, the British sunk one of the uh, German submarines early and then got the keys for like months of Enigma. And then they were able to break a whole bunch of messages. And so the reason why we don't do something like the Enigma anymore is because we figured out a better way of distributing keys. And that's what the modern cipher is. So we want to get them all the way up to way, the way we do cryptography today. And this is uh, this public key cryptography. And we use a form of this public key cryptography based on this dominating set problem. And it's very visual and it's very hands-on. We can have them sort of figure out what the public key is by moving things around this graph. Uh, so, um, and you know, the actual details of this, I have presents for each of these modules. So ahead of time, you can actually look through the presents and try and uh, figure them out yourself. So all of this, this material is available from uh, a, a different URL, which I'll, I'll get, cyberd.org and ctf.org has all of the material. Um, and quite, yeah, all the presents that explain this. Okay. Uh, and then the last one is when you have a modern cipher, Turns out uh, you have a problem if your adversary is inside the network. And this gets us all the way up to the NSA and the GHCQ programs for trying to hijack the certificates of Google and Facebook and these sorts of things. So there's a program called Flying Fig, uh, which basically is like, if I really need to target one of the Google users or one of the Facebook users, I'm gonna target that user. And when that user asks for a Google certificate, I'm gonna send them one of my own. And then we show them this attack using a role play where Tim Shear is playing a router on the internet. And uh, he takes one of these messages and he, he ate it the first year, but he didn't the second year. <laughs> but he eventually substitutes, you know, sleight of hand substitutes a, his own sort of certificate in that looks exactly like the original certificate that a student had sent him. But he has his sleight of hand and it goes all the way to the end and they decrypt the message and it says, what did it say? Does anyone remember? You know, pay Tim a hundred dollars or something like that, or I forget. Uh, and then the student's like, I didn't send that. And then we explain how that whole thing happened, and it's exactly what happened. It is happening when you have a program like like Fine. Okay. So those are the five modules. Uh, uh, there are two parts of this exercise. Um, the CTF is trying to measure um, the student's ability to understand and, and decrypt these uh, messages. So this is the format of it. Uh, 24 scaffold the challenges. They're, they're all in front of you except for the number 23. I didn't put 23 there because that's the, uh, that's the public key crypto one, which um, you can get the printout of it in the instructor pack, which is available on that site. But uh, uh, just for brevity, I gave you 23 of them. Uh, so these are given in sets, like six to eight of them every day. And then the team is supposed to collaborate on them and on solving them uh, that day. Uh, and this, this is scaffolded to, uh, to cultivate confidence and competence in their ability to decode messages. So uh, each level has a very simple uh, and common gameplay mechanism. Uh, the idea is that you decode a message to find the key that unlocks a file and so they're given a USB key with a bunch of diary entries. And each of those encrypted messages will decode into a key that will unlock one diary entry. And I've given you examples of diary entries for the first six. So this will be the first day's diary entries. And so they decrypt message number one and they get diary entry number one. And the diary entry has a story that it's got a, another, it's a puzzle within a puzzle that forces them to, to, to research a security uh, topic and then answer it in order to submit the flag that actually gets them the credit for that one day. Okay, so 
uh, you decode a message, you find the key, unlocks the file, uh, and uh, that is the format. Here's an example. Uh, we teach them uh, ASCII, and we show them how the ASCII table is just a mapping between a number and a letter that it's supposed to represent. And so there's a, and I'm sorry about the ASCII table, you can barely read it, but there's an ASCII table that we'll give them. As soon as we explain binary and hexadecimal, we'll show them ASCII, and so there, we show them a, a, a mapping between the numbers in binary and hexadecimal and the character it represents. And so here's one of the challenges. It's a bunch of decimal numbers. First, they have to look at it and say, those are decimal numbers because I don't see any letters, right? The letter, so hexadecimal has digits and letters because it's a 16, it's a base 16, and so they use A through F as digits. So immediately they're like, okay, that's not hexadecimal. It's not binary because there's, you know, a five in there, right? It's not all ones and zeros. That's decimal. Uh, what do I know that, you know, that maps decimal into something like character based? ASCII mapping. And so what you do is you go through and you go through the ASCII table and decode this and you'll be like, oh, the key for the seventh is, is what that says. And then it'll give you the key and then you'll go to that PDF and you'll unlock that entry. And it'll give you this, this uh, diary entry. And then you read the diary entry and it's like it's a puzzle within a puzzle. You're doing some research on a security uh, topic and then submitting an answer. And then we have a website that will that they'll use to submit the answer from the diary. So the answer isn't the key that unlocks the diary entry. The answer is actually the diary entry blanks that, that we have them fill in. Okay, so that's the mechanism. Here's another example. Uh, this is the Caesar wheel. So again, uh, one of the things, the ways to decode the Caesar wheel is that you know the message starts with the key. So immediately you can rotate that thing. Well, maybe they'll, it'll take them a little while to figure that out. But like uh, you could rotate the T, the T is over here. You can put the, the yin and the yang symbol, which is over here. You rotate it to the T, and then you can try and do that substitution. And then you get the key for June 30th, uh, 13th is, and then that will unlock June 13th's diary entry. So that's the gameplay mechanism. Uh, and the only thing that changes is the encryption scheme. Yeah. Real quick, how do you relate the Um, so if you know, this is the repeated plain text. So this is the thing that broke Enigma. I know every single message begins with the key. The key for, in fact, it begins with the key for. So after you get to the, the third or the fourth, no, actually the Caesar cipher might be the eighth or the ninth one, you know the format. And this is the attack on the repeated uh, plain text. Is that now I can guess that that yin and the yang is probably the, or the, the first three characters is probably and this is what we'll teach them uh, as part of this. And they'll, they'll be able to understand, oh, yeah, repeated plain text, maybe not so good, especially for this kind of cipher. And then, yeah, that's where that becomes important. Okay. Uh, okay, so the other level of engagement is this storyline. So here's the idea. Um, so the CTF challenges, uh, basically evaluate uh, someone the cryptography uh, uh, skills. Uh, one of the things that we wanted to do was provide an extra level of engagement by embedding these challenges into a story. So using the arcs and using sort of an emotional motivation to get them further engaged into the, into the activity. Um, and so the challenges open up these individual diary entries and base the story around Divergent, which is this uh, uh, young adult series by Veronica Roth, uh, a set of novels. And so students have at least, well, a lot of them have at least watched the movie, if not read the books. Yeah. Can we encourage them to read one of the books? <laughs> sure, you could, yeah, you can do I think we're going to show, do we show Divergent? Oh, we can't show Divergent this year. Yeah. yeah, we showed it last camp, but, uh, and people, that, students really loved that. And that. That was one of the better things that we did, but I don't think, yeah. Yeah, if they want to watch it, uh, yeah. <laughs> as a, as a, yeah, to, actually that would make this much better. Okay, so why Divergent? Okay, 30 million copies. Uh, I think the plot itself is relevant to the CyberPDX uh, camp. Uh, it talks about the use and abuse of technology. How did they get to that dystopian world? And that's what we want kids to, to think about here. Um, it's got a diversity theme, so uh, female protagonist, but also if you're Divergent, that means you're good at a lot of things. 
and you're being ostracized. Well, we actually, you know, those are the heroes, right? So they end up saving the whole thing. So that's what we want these kids to sort of you know, shoot towards, the, the important of being uh, sort of multi-talented and having multiple expertise. Uh, and it also, good for us, has a computer security subplot uh, that's amenable to adaptation. Like when I read this short story, I'm like, hey, I'm going to use this. Actually, it's way better than the Hunger Games. The Hunger Games didn't have anything. It'd be like it'd be painful to adapt the Hunger, Hunger Games to uh, to this kind of activity. So, uh, so the plot is uh, so for those of you who don't know what uh, the Divergent plot is, there's five clans: uh, Dauntless, Abnegation, Erudite, Candor, and Amity. And if you happen to have sort of characteristics across all of those, and each one, so uh, Dauntless means you got courage. Abnegation means you have a good heart. Uh, Erudite means you're intellectual. Candor, you tell the truth. Amity, what is Amity? You're a nature person. Your kind? Oh, okay. I thought that was abnegation. Oh, whatever. If you have multiple traits, though, you're divergent. Okay. And so uh, both Triss and uh, Thor are are divergent, and those are the two main uh, protagonists. Uh, and so it turns out Thor is a little sort of hacker, actually. And this shows up in uh, the short stories that were released after the, the series of three novels. So in the I forget the name of this story, but there's a story there that talks about Thor doing basically penetration testing against the Aerodite. He's basically trying to hack into the systems to figure out the plan to destroy the abnegation plan. Uh, and so uh, the very first entry, the very first you know, two or three of the entries are based on exactly the plot that, that's in there. Shoulder surfing, that was basically uh, part of the short story that Veronica Roth had written in uh, to it. And so I just took that and I ran with it. Well, how many other security things can I add to Thor's uh, uh, adventures? So, okay, so, so in the uh, camp, the plot adaptation is that Thor has just disappeared before camp. Triss contacts the campers for help. Uh, the clues that she has found in Thor's apartment uh, include a USB key with this electronic diary on it and some printouts of encoded messages, which are the ones that you have in front of you. Uh, and the printouts encode the keys to unlock the diary entries, and uh, he has encrypted them because he's gotten this uh, control room security training, which is part of the novel. Um, and so this is the training that we tell the students that they're, they're being given now, right? So they, so they understand cryptography. And then she asks the campers to find out what Four was working on, so there's a little bit of a mystery and unlocking the uh, the diary entries let, lets them know, oh, Thor was doing this, shoulder surfing, eh? That's what he was working on, uh, these sorts of things. OK, so the challenges. Uh, so those are your printouts. Uh, and I think I just described the mechanics already. Uh, I should say that the difficulty will steadily increase on these things. OK. And so revisiting curricular goals, uh, the cryptography addresses the, uh, is being addressed by the, the keys that unlock the diary entries. Uh, the diary entries themselves, uh, that is, is what uh, we use to introduce the security concepts and the tools. So, and this is an attempt to inspire curiosity and appreciation for computer security among the students. Because in their research of trying to, to solve these challenges, they'll come up with, they'll see a lot of interesting things related to security in their, in their Google searches, okay? And so um, because this is being done in context of this plot in a memorable way, hopefully, we hope that they can actually internalize something uh, from this, okay? So uh, the mechanics, okay, uh, the diary is set in the preceding month. And so we'll see when we pivot to the urban race, that, that sort of is in, you know, the way that's set up is to make the timeline so that uh, the plot sort of comes to, to the, on Friday, when the urban race hits, they are jumping into the plot. So at first they're like, oh, a month ago, Thor disappeared, I gotta figure out what happened to him. And then they'll get this pivot where they're actually interacting with a virtual Thor to help him out directly. So that's the, uh, that's the, what we're gonna do. And so each entry describes a tool and technique central to computer security. And then it's got that Jeopardy mechanic where we describe the tool or technique. It's not disclosed directly, uh, but then they have to research an aspect of computer security to identify that, that method. All right, so there will be 24 of these that the, each team will then submit those 24 answers onto the website, and that's how we, 
you score uh, score them. So uh, here's an example of an example uh, an example of an entry. Um, and so this describes a security tool. And if they start Googling for um, a, a, a scanner in 1998, and then Tenable, so the company that makes it is called Ten Tenable Networks. So they got all these clues, and then they've got. Well, so when we first ran it, there was a this was a jumble, but people were not even looking at this. They were going straight to the jumble, and so we're like, all right, we need to make this a little bit harder. So they actually are forced to look at this because there were a lot of. I was talking to a, a camper. She was like, yeah, we couldn't really read any of that stuff. We tried. We just threw it in an anagram solver. <laughs> And then, oh yeah, you heard the words, and well, let's just try those. So uh, now they're like fill in the blank, which I'm hoping is easier, uh, is harder for them to just, you know, no anagram solving, except for the last one. The last puzzle is an anagram. Uh, so that's 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 the way. So it's a little different than what you see here. Okay, so you can follow four and figure out how he does all of these things, and these things are all security related things, uh, which I'll just gloss over. And that's the plot. And at the very end, the last entry, uh, students read about how he has uncovered an air gap system. This means a computer that's not connected to the network that has everything he needs on it. And so that's what that's why he disappeared. He went to go after this, this air gap computer on the Erudite campus, which is Portland State. <laughs> and then uh, that's what he's doing. So that, then, then they figure out on Thursday that that's what's happening. Okay, and this leads to the urban race, and uh, I'm going to ask all of you in this room to keep a secret because the campers are not supposed to know that this urban race is going to happen. We're, we've scheduled a regular lecture for Friday, and then we want to have Tim Shear run in screaming, saying, urgent message from Tris, and turn that lecture into this activity, so to surprise them. And I think last year, some students knew. There's, there's a handful of students who knew, and then there were some who were like, God, ah, I'm wearing flip-flops. I can't do this thing. I can't do this activity. He took a picture of his, his shoes, and he was like, I'm in trouble. Uh, but basically, if you can keep it under wraps, uh, this is what's going to happen on Friday uh, for the crypto thread. Uh, so we drop them into the live story. This is the capstone activity. Uh, and so uh, we pivot from the lecture to live action, and we insert the students directly into the plot. And this is a, an exercise that takes about an hour and a half. Uh, the fastest team finished it in an hour. And then some teams required um, two and a half hours. Uh, I, I think uh, what we can do with, with the teachers knowing how to guide students, I think it'll be hopefully, like if, if it gets to the one and a half hour mark, uh, if we could have teachers be more active in helping them actually save the city. So that, you know, they end up saying every team gets to save the city. We want every team to save the city. So this is where you would, you would want to give them a push to get the, some satisfaction that they, they accomplished uh, the thing. And they're basically similar. Like if you've gone through all the 24 challenges, uh, you should be able to take the urban race challenges and solve or help them solve those. Because the urban race challenges are just chains of these encryption schemes uh, that they have to solve. Okay. Okay, so here's the story set up. Tris relays urgent message, an urgent message from four. He's trapped outside of this erudite control room that uh, needs some authentication before he can get in. And that control room has that air gap computer that he's going after to destroy. And as soon as he destroys that computer, he saves the city. He saves everybody. Okay, uh, and of course, the erudite have protected this room with puzzles. And it, it requires cryptography skills, but it also requires knowledge of the Erudite campus, right? So that, they're using two-factor authentication, which I think we do talk about. Uh, we did talk about last, so as part of the um, modules, we talk about passwords and, and, and authentication. So it's using two-factor two authentication. Um, and it's basically uh, authenticating <coughs> his knowledge of puzzles, which only Erudite would know how to solve these puzzles, right? Because they're the only ones smart enough. Uh, and then only Erudite would know anything about their campus. So ask an esoteric question about the campus, the Erudite should know about it. And so uh, he's stuck in this outer room trying to get in. He can't answer either of these two. Well, he, he needs help answering both of these, right? He doesn't have this. So he asks the campers 
to do this for him and to uh, Twitter message him back with the answer so we can actually get into the room. So you're trying to facilitate for breaking into this room, destroying this computer, and saving the city. And that's their capstone activity. Okay. So it requires cryptography and knowledge of the Erudite campus. And then uh, it has to be solved quickly. We give them till 3 p.m. I think we started it at 10. We give them five hours. But really, it would take an hour and a half or two hours. Um, uh, and uh, we don't want them to just be guessing all the time. So we give them 10 incorrect guesses so that they really have to uh, solve the thing. Uh, all right. And then we give each team for its Twitter handle. And they're off to the races. Um, uh, so the race is modeled after uh, City Sol Challenge Nation and the Amazing Race. So uh, these cryptographic clues are, are, are given by four to Tris, and then Tris relays it to, to the campers. And once decrypted, the clues will send teams throughout campus uh, to answer questions. And then they communicate with uh, Virtual Four over Twitter to relay the answers. So here's an example from the first year where they're decrypting the messages. And then after they decrypted the messages, it turns into a question that must be answered by running across campus and seeing something or you know, trying, to, trying to find what the, what the question was. All right, so uh, four is a Twitter bot that we programmed that gives the illusion that campers are interacting with the actual character. Uh, so it takes the answers and updates the storyline state for each individual team. Every team has an instance of the story that they're trying to progress through. So it allows every team to save the city, which is, which is a goal. Um, and then uh, the first place team is quietly given an extra challenge, which leads them to a lockbox and a special prize, uh, just to acknowledge uh, uh, the fact that uh, a certain team uh, finished first. And this prize was a uh, dinner dinner with uh, our local Turing Award winner, uh, which is uh, Ivan Sutherland. So I think, I don't know, we haven't asked him, but hopefully he, he can do that again this year. But we'll see. So here's an example of the Twitter interaction. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, and they, you know, this is the thing saying they, they saved the city. All right. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah, it's hilarious. They were interacting with the bot after they had solved it, and the bot uh, crashed because of the, some of the characters they sent. <laughs> so uh, it's always every year. I like it's always exposing bugs in the bot. So I'm always babysitting this bot when this happens. So maybe maybe Dave, you can debug my Python code because uh, I write. Yeah, my code is not something that's very solid right now. <laughs> so okay, so why did we do all of this? Uh, so I don't know if any of you have heard about Flow. This is a state coined by uh, the psychologist, Mahali, I can't pronounce his last name. But it's uh, to get people in a state of single-minded focus on a task that aligns a person's emotions and motivation with the objective at hand. Uh, so deep enjoyment, creativity, and a total involvement uh, with life. A lot of these extreme sports people, that's what they're looking for. Uh, when they get to that state, they know that uh, that's, that's why they do that kind of stuff. Uh, but it's a powerful intrinsic motivator. Uh, and so that's where we're trying to tap into. Um, uh, it's often key in making engaging learning experiences. So I'll, I'll, they, at least when I play CTFs, I can get into that state because I really want to solve those. In fact, the code.org thing is a perfect example. I just really want to solve more of those things. Uh, and then you get engaged. And that, that helps you uh, engage in that activity. So that's what our goal is with this activity is to try and do the same. Uh, and so you'll see the way we design for flow is that we put triggers throughout the CTF and throughout the urban race, clear goals, a balance of challenge and skill level, so it's not neither too frustrating or too easy. Uh, you get immediate feedback as to whether or not your solution worked. That's important. And you get this rich environment. So we put it in the, in the plot of Divergent to hopefully uh, add that. And then with the ur urban race, there's risk. There's a common shared goal amongst your team. And then constant group communication. So you're constantly communicating with your runners running all over campus. The people decoding the messages and the people trying to figure out the, others, the other half of the puzzle are always in communication. OK. So this was last year's Urban Race winners. Uh, so this is the educational unicorn. It's, you, know, you could bottle that up and, and, and get your students there you know, every class. Hard to get. But that's what, uh, that's what we were looking for. So, okay, so in terms of the material, um, 
So we've done this uh, multiple times, the CTF and the urban, well, the CTF in, a, in, in all of these times, but the urban race is, it's tied to the Portland State campus, uh, the current urban race. So you would need to adapt the urban race a little bit to get it uh, locally. Uh, and I'd be happy to help uh, with that. Uh, so it's been used multiple times. Um, students like it. Uh, this is, I think, last year's uh, data. I think this is, uh, yeah, the last year's Gen Cyber data. Uh, so we had 32 female, 23 male. Um, uh, all of the content for using this is here. So the diary entries are in the instructor pack, the zip file. So that's the link. And eventually, for the week of the camp, I'm going to take down the instructor pack. Uh, but after the camp is done, I'll put it back up. But yeah, I don't want to. I don't want the students, because all the plain text diary entries and, and stuff that are there, so I'll take that off. Uh, but uh, that's where you would go after the camp to get all this material, uh, including the presence, links to all of the lecture material uh, that you could use. And, and, um, uh, for the urban race, it would require source code. In fact, I can give you source code for both generating those mm -hmm. and for the urban race, if you'd like. Uh, it's just a Bitbucket repository. I just add you and you pull out all uh, so, yeah, we're going to play the game. We've got copies of all the CTF challenges. Uh, this I don't have. Uh, a mini urban race. I didn't create one for this workshop, but I could do that uh, maybe on the follow-up. What, are we going to have a workshop in the fall? Maybe I could do a, a mini urban race. Because a lot of, so, teachers in the past wanted to participate in this, and so they violated the no-touching thing because they really wanted to do the puzzles also. So, uh when it was first offered, we had a mini one for the teachers at the beginning. But I could offer one uh, also towards, in fact, that would be a better way to do this workshop is to do an urban race on it. Uh, but maybe next time I'll be more organized. Uh, this is what uh, student and teacher feedback was on it. Uh, and I'll leave it at that. Uh, I'm going to pause and ask for questions or comments before I'm going to show you, I don't know how many of these we'll get through, but the rest of the time, uh, we're gonna just go one by one through these puzzles and just solve them. Uh, the URL that I've given you is a URL to this playlist. Um, do I have it? So yeah, you go to this URL. All right, so these are walkthroughs of all 24 challenges. And so again, uh, yeah, hopefully you're the only one on your team that's got this URL. So when students are stuck on a particular challenge, mm -hmm. you can be like, oh, hang on a second. Let me, um, let me go to my room for a second, and then you can watch this. <laughs> and then you can go back and say, hey, have you thought about uh, ASCII here? And then they can be, oh, yeah, let me try that. That's what these things are for. Or if you want to, just watch them. I think it was a total of like an hour of content. So you see some of these things are like a minute long. Uh, so this would be something to watch all the way through. Uh, the other thing is if they're researching one of the answers to the diary, I have also a longer video. So this one's the hour. Uh, so the challenges will sum up to about an hour. And then the divergent, uh, the diary walkthrough, I sort of explain the concept. I explain, you know, sort of give the background of the tool, and then I solve the, every one of those 24. So here, you should be able to now help your students all the way up until Friday morning. And then if they really have mastered all of that, they're really well prepared for the urban race. And then they'll be able to jump in, and they'll, they'll just do their thing. Um, there's only like one trick in the urban race that they hadn't seen at the beginning of the week. And that is that so they, they, look at, they look for, so steganography is something that we teach them. So they take an image, and then in the metadata, they see, oh, the message is in there. And so there's this site that will read the metadata of an image. So in the urban race, for the very first time, instead of the metadata, metadata being some text, it's actually GPS coordinates. And then they're supposed to go to that location. And so when they look it up, they'll be like, oh, it's that part of campus. It's exactly there. That's where I'm supposed to look for this particular clue. That's the only thing that we threw at them was slightly different to separate the teams. I mean, because you don't want them all to finish at the exact same time, because then you're like, well, who's going to get this, you know, sort of thing. But that's the, there's this one 
uh, Uber puzzle. It's got a long chain, and that's the one that's going to take them the longest. The other four, five puzzles are pretty easy, but it's that one thing that's sort of the blocking factor, and then that's that's one of the ways to slow them down. But it should only take them an hour and a half uh, from beginning to end. Okay. Um, you guys just want to start solving. In fact, maybe as groups, you could just start decoding things. Um, I know it's going to be hard without, for example, the Visionaire. It's hard to solve the Visionaire without knowledge. I don't have a document scanner, so I can't really you know, show you these things. I can play some videos if you'd like. If you want to do, maybe everyone can do the first challenge. And then uh, I can play the video walkthrough of it. Does that sound good? So yeah, let's do that. So the first one, um, yeah, the first one, so it starts with that example that we gave them where the, de the, the decimal sort of looks like stuff that might be characters. This is the first one. Uh, it's got a bunch of numbers. And then uh, below that, you see a bunch of numbers that only have zeros and ones. That's binary. And so then you're like, oh, uh, you know, maybe the binary is going to map into an ASCII character also. And so that is their operation. Just to show them that both decimal and binary could be mapped into characters is the very first one. And so they would go through the table. And, and one of the things, so the table actually has the binary pattern, uh, the hexadecimal pattern, and the decimal pattern, and then the ASCII character, the letter that it maps to. The only thing with the binary pattern is that all the leading zeros are gone. So it's like a, in a typical, when you write a typical you know, decimal number, all the leading zeros you would omit. Same with the binary, but that makes, that makes decoding this difficult. Because if you're looking, you have to count the number of bits, right? And then if it's if it's not there, if it's not justified properly, you're like, is that six or seven digits? You don't know where to start. That's the only issue with that table. Um, but I think I could probably generate a table that's got the leading zeros, which would, which would be more helpful. Whatever. Yeah. Uh, oh, yeah, you could also convert this. So one of the things we show them in the camp is, like, you have this binary number. You can convert that to hexadecimal. Uh, and so I think those who are new to this, um, there is a module, the, the first module, or the second module, it talks about converting from binary to hexadecimal, and then you would use hexadecimal to look up. Uh, so, so let me just have you do that, look up on the ASCII table, and then fill in the, <coughs> fill in the message, and then I'll play the video, and then I think